very excited that all day today and tomorrow morning, the sessions will highlight the use of focused ultrasound for the treatment of cancer. And we'll hear exciting results using focused ultrasound to treat a variety of cancers and utilizing several different mechanisms, including ablation, drug delivery, and immunomodulation. But first, to kick things off, we are thrilled to have Greg Simon here to discuss Vice President Biden's Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Greg is the Executive Director of the White House Cancer Moonshot Task Force, and he has a long history in the healthcare and policy worlds, including positions as President of Faster Cures, CEO of the healthcare investing firm Polywog, Senior Vice President of Policy at Pfizer, and also Chief Domestic Policy Advisor to then Vice President Al Gore. So we're thrilled that he's here. Thank you so much, Greg, for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I don't have any slides, so you don't have to do this. Um, I want to thank Neil, who I've known. We were just trying to figure that out. I think I've known him now for 12 or 13 years um, for building this organization and for uh, inviting me to speak here today. He and the vice president have a very special relationship uh, since Focus Ultrasound was very critical to the vice president's health at one point in his life. Um, Many years ago, when my first child was born, he had a little breathing tick. And they said, we have to put him in the ICU for four hours. It was Labor Day. It was 7 o'clock at night. And said, so we're going to put him in this glass box for four hours just to watch him, and then, you, then we'll bring him to you. And we said, OK. Well, around 11 o'clock, 11.30, no child. So I went down to the ICU, and I said, like to get my baby. And they said, well, the nurse who checked him in is gone. They changed shifts. We'll just keep him here overnight in a glass box. And I thought, no, nah, that's not going to work. And I said, well, no, I, I think my wife really would like to see her baby. <laughs> so they said, well, we have to redo the paperwork. I said, I'll wait. So they did the paperwork, and they said, we have to take the baby to the nursery, but you can't just hand it to you. I said, I got that. So they took the baby to the nursery. And I went into the nursery, and I said, I'd like the baby. And they said, you sleep. We'll take care of the baby here. And I said, no, I, I don't think so. My wife really can't sleep right now. She needs to feed this baby. And they said, no, you go. Ahead. we'll bring the baby to you in the morning. It was midnight or so. And it was a holiday, so it, hospitals are staffed differently on holidays. And I said, no, I really want my baby. So they said, OK. So they brought the baby down. So now it was 1 in the morning. The baby was supposed to have been ours around 11 o'clock at night. And I learned a lesson then that came back to me many years later. And I always tell anybody going into the hospital for any reason, you cannot be alone in a hospital and expect a good outcome. The hospital in that case was not organized around my baby. It was organized around the nursing schedule. The nursery was organized around their schedule. Everybody was organized around his or her schedule. None of them was organized around the baby, the patient. Years later, two years ago, I was getting off an airplane, and I'd had a physical four days earlier, and I hadn't gotten the results. And I knew if I didn't call my doctor just then, I was, in la I was landing in San Francisco, if I didn't call the doctor right then, he'd be closed, and uh, it'd be another day, and I was kind of curious, because I'd had a few issues over the time. I called him while I'm getting my bag out of the overhead, and I said, you know, do you have my results yet? You know, it's been four days. He said, well, your PSA is good, your cholesterol is good, but by the way, I think you have leukemia. By the way, I think you have leukemia. And keep in mind, I called him, right? He didn't call me. So I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you have 160,000 white cells, and that's, that's not good. So you need to get this checked. I said, well, I'm in San Francisco. Well, fortunately, I was having dinner with a doctor. So I got it checked. To make a long story short, that worked out just fine. I did have CLL, and I had a year before I needed to be treated. This time last year, I started treatment. January, I finished treatment. Total success story. No adverse effect from the chemotherapy. Very rare, but wonderful. But it occurred to me again, just like with my child, how the system wasn't organized around me. 
I had to call my doctor to find out I had leukemia. And the, the, the thing that I have learned working in Faster Cures and in my own personal experience is unless we organize a system focused on patients, no technology, no medical education, no new advances in immunotherapy are going to bring to patients the benefits they could. And that's one of the reasons why the cancer moonshot is so important. We have got to reorganize our cancer enterprise and all of our medical enterprises around the patient first. That has got to be the organizing principle. Any other organizing principle is unfair to the very people that all of you got into your disciplines to help. So in, as you know, in, in February at the State of the Union, the, vice, the president asked the vice president to lead the so-called cancer moonshot. Why a moonshot? I happened to be a space nut, and I was on the House Space Committee for many years as a staff director of a subcommittee, and I was very involved with the space program. When Kennedy said we were going to go to the moon, he didn't say we're going to create a new program for moonology. He didn't say we're going to create new tenured positions in rocketry all over the country. He said we're going to take a human being and land them on the moon and bring them back safely. That was the focus. That it was all organized around the human being, not the technology. The technology was in service of humanity, not the other way around. In our moonshot, we're doing the same thing. We all talk about technologies a lot because those are the way we get there. Focused ultrasound, immunotherapy, new kinds of radiation, new kinds of chemotherapy, new forms of prevention. But at the end of the day, the cancer moonshot is about getting human beings through their lives without being adversely affected by cancer, either inconvenienced as I was because I knew from the beginning that there were several options for me, or to have their lives shortened. When I was diagnosed with leukemia a few months earlier, a dear friend of mine who was 40 years old, two young children, told me that she had a glioblastoma. I knew what her next 18 months was going to be like, and she didn't. And I didn't really know how much to tell her, so I only helped her find some doctors to let her have her own journey. About the time that I finished my chemotherapy, she died, about 18 months later. And that has been a story in glioblastoma, as you all know very well, for our entire lives. So we know that we have a long way to go to get people through this journey <clears throat> without their lives being shortened or made miserable because of cancers that we have not been able to conquer or turn into chronic diseases. So the vice president has organized this moonshot, this attempt to bring everybody safely home, so to speak, around the patient. And he's done that in a variety of ways. You know, the vice president, as he says, didn't choose to become a cancer expert. It chose him unlike you all who choose to become experts in this area. And one of the things he has learned is that we have to change our culture of research because that is underlying all of our problems. We're only human, so we have ways of operating that in, we inherit from generations before us. So publication really hasn't changed since the 1800s in Germany. Uh, oncology lexicon hasn't really changed since the French in the 1700s. The way NIH and NCI give out money hasn't really changed since after World War II when the government said we will, we will fund academic research. It's, it's odd that everything else in your life has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Everything. Think about banking. Think about travel agents. Think about going to a library, think about picking up a TV show on your internet, on your phone, instead of dropping by blockbusters for a video. Everything has changed except your interaction with the doctor and your interaction with the research system. So that is one of the huge goals that he's undertaken is we can do a lot with new technology. We can do a, not, a lot with better regulation. We can do a lot with education around prevention. But we've got to change the assumptions of our system because the assumptions of our system 
are that every grant is a year long, every project needs to be down the middle of the road, every grant recipient needs to be 40 or older. We can no longer afford those assumptions. That's not how the rest of the world works. When Sean Parker, founder of Twitter, I mean, the founder of, um, one of the founders of Facebook and, and, and Napster, um, and part of Twitter, when he founded his new Parker Institute for Immunotherapy, he did not model it after the NIH. When Mike Milken started the Prostate Cancer Foundation, he did not model it after the NIH. They created accelerated reviews, accelerated grants, open sharing, collaboration among institutions, collaboration among investigators, and a more ubiquitous or more fair way of giving credit for people's work rather than just the first or the last author. So we need to look at the new shoots that are coming up of how to do research and mimic those rather than staying in the middle of the road as we have for so long with the largest funder of medical research, the federal government. So the cancer moonshot itself is a series of different things. Neil was on something called the Blue Ribbon Panel, which was also established by the president, which was designed to focus on the scientific agenda. If we, are, if we get new funding from Congress, which we've asked for, close to a billion dollars, how should we spend it? What are the priorities? Then there's the task force, of which I am the executive director and Vice President Biden is in charge, which is over 20 cabinet and sub-cabinet agencies that are looking at how the government can change the way it does business, both in terms of how the agencies interact with each other, but also how they interact with the private sector <clears throat> and academia. Um, and then there's uh, Vice President Biden himself, who is a force of nature on his own. He has visited scores of cancer centers, institutions, and hospitals. He has met with literally hundreds of individuals, and he has spoken to over 20,000 people at the major cancer and scientific conferences in just the last six months. He has learned about immunotherapy at a level that would surprise all of you, and he has a passion and an authenticity that I think everybody recognizes is unique and sadly earned. What he wants to be able to do is to start something that becomes inevitable, to start changes that become inevitable, and to start new ideas that become indispensable. So let me give you a few examples. We had a summit on June 29th, more of a launch summit, that had 400 people here in Washington at Howard University, but we had 7,000 people at 270 individual sites in every state, including Puerto Rico and Guam and Washington, D.C., on the same day to focus on workshops, not lectures, about how anybody can help serve the cancer moonshot. And if you go to hashtag canserve.org, you will see, or .gov, you will see thousands of ways in which people have volunteered to help. But we announced over 40 different initiatives that day. One example of how the moonshot is changing the way people think. The VA is part of the task force. The VA is the largest hospital in the world. They have thousands of people with cancer. They want to sequence those cancers. Meanwhile, almost just a home run from here, you have the Mirtha Cancer Center, which to my surprise, and maybe yours, is one of the top sequencing facilities in the world. They have somewhere like 12 to 15 X10 sequencers from Illumina. They have a surgical operating room built over a pathology lab so they can go from excision to characterization in 30 minutes for a biopsy because the tissue gets on its own little elevator and goes right into the path lab. They have the ability to sequence human whole genomes several a day. So when I learned that, and the VA is over here asking, what can we do for our patients? I asked Mirtha Walter Reed, can't you sequence the VA tumors? Yeah. Have you all ever talked about that? No. So we created a collaboration between the VA and Walter Reed, 
where Walter Reed will now sequence tumors from VA cancer patients for free. Just leave a little piece of the tissue behind if you would. Meanwhile, IBM had come to me and said, we want to help. We have Watson. How can we help? Well, Watson's highest function is really its library function, having read everything in the medical literature, which none of us will ever do. So I said, well, you know, when Walter Reed analyzes all these tumors, sequences them, someone's got to figure out what's the best course of action. It'll take a tumor board a long time to figure this out for every mutation. <clears throat> so IBM said, we'll do that, and we'll do it for free for two years. We will take all the mutation data from the sequencing and give the tumor board the best options available in the medical literature for that particular patient, and we can do it in a day. Okay, let's do that. So that was one of the collaborations that's announced and it's underway. George Washington University came to see us and said, we want to do something on tobacco cessation using social media and digital technologies. Case Western Cancer Center came in to see me the next week. We want to do something on tobacco cessation. We have an addiction expert who has new theories of how to change behavior. So I said, well, have you met George Washington University? No, we haven't. Now they have a program to do tobacco cessation using digital technology and the latest of addiction neuroscience in Cleveland and Washington, both of which have higher than average lung cancer rates, higher than average smoking rates, and lower than average early detection rates, so that we can get these new collaborations up and running. So there are so many opportunities for people to make a difference. The, v, the FDA created a new oncology center of excellence so that if you come into the FDA <clears throat> with a technology or a drug or a diagnostic, you don't have three different groups of people who have different expertise in oncology or none ex evaluating your product. They now put all of those reviews under one center run by Rick Pastor, who's been the head of the oncology group for many years, so that you have uniform review of anything related to oncology. The patent office has agreed to accelerate cancer patent reviews to get them done under one year, which is a year and a half below the average, and to do them for free. Everybody is making a contribution to what's going on with the moonshot. Now, apart from why did you name it the moonshot, most people ask the question, what do you think you can get done in nine months? Because this started around March. And the answer is nine months is just how much time we have left in the administration. That's not how much time we have left to fight cancer. And at least one of the presidential candidates has said that she will keep this initiative going if she's elected. The other one hasn't opined on it yet, but we hope he will. You know, in 1971, you have to admire Nixon for starting a war on cancer without an army, without any weapons, and without a battle plan. He just knew we needed to do it. Now, 45 years later, we have a huge army. We have incredible weapons. But we needed a general. We needed one person to say, we're going that way. We're going to do this, and we're going to do it now, not later. We're going to change the way we train people. We're going to change the way we organize people. We're going to change the way we review things and the way we fund things. And that person needed to be Joe Biden. And it turned out that there he was. And that is what makes this such a different time. It's not just about agencies talking to each other. It's about everybody working under one common purpose. And that common purpose is to achieve a decade's worth of progress in the fight against all cancers in five years and to change the face of cancer. The vice president's well aware that some cancers are going to take longer than five years to figure out, but we don't need to be wasting time with the ones we do have figured out, but those therapies, those diagnostics aren't available equitably across the country or across the world. We know that place more than race determines how well you do with cancer. I grew up in a, what I call a magical town, very close to where John Grisham grew up, where he wrote a book 
called A Painted House about a little town in Arkansas that was in the cotton country and was inundated every fall with Mexican laborers picking cotton. That's how I grew up. Little town of 20,000 people and every fall 20,000 Mexican laborers showed up to help with the cotton crop. Everybody spoke a little Spanish. There was a Spanish speaking, Spanish language movie theater in my hometown. And it was a magical place, not just for that, but you can't get cancer in my hometown except on Tuesdays and Thursdays, because those are the days doctors come over from Memphis. The rest of the time, you're in the clear. If you stay home on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you live a long life. Well, one day my dad made the mistake of going to the doctor on Tuesday when he was 90 years old, and they said, you have lung cancer. Well, what do you do when you're living in the Delta and you have lung cancer, and one doctor says you need chemo, and the other doctor, and there are only two, says you need radiation? Well. I, being a fortunate young man, was able to call the deputy director of the NCI and say, what do we do? He said, forget the chemo, your dad's going to die, but you doesn't have to suffer, do the radiation, keep his lungs clear, and ease his pain. Very few people in my hometown could have gotten that kind of advice. Very few people in my hometown today can get that kind of advice. The Delta is still one of the poorest places in the country. So we have to remember that since 75 to 80 percent of people get treated in places like my hometown, in communities, not big cancer centers, that even when we make progress, we are not getting it to all the people who need it. Whether it's clinical trials, whether it's new therapies, whether it's new approaches to who needs chemo and who doesn't, who needs radiation and who doesn't, yes, if you're in New York or Washington, you have a much better shot of having a humane course of treatment. But if you're not, you don't. So the vice president, as they say, he's, they call him middle class Joe, he didn't grow up in a huge area. He's born in Scranton and grew up and worked in Wilmington. So he knows small towns and he knows the challenges of getting things to people where they are, not telling them, well, hope you can go to Seattle for your clinical trial. Hope you can go to New York for your clinical trial. That's not how it works. So. The nine months that we had this year is the beginning of action of some of the things I've mentioned to you earlier, but also the beginning of an effort that will carry on one way or another, one place or another, after this administration. The Vice President has already said he will do this the rest of his life. I've been working in this field since 2003 when I started Faster Cures. Everyone I've met who wants to help with the moonshot has a lifetime commitment to do this, as do you. So <clears throat> the moonshot has a lot of technical and legal aspects. We have a report we'll give the president by the end of the year, probably even before the election. We have the blue ribbon panel scientific report that will uh, be an, uh, reviewed in an open hearing on September 7th, uh, not far from here. Um, the vice president will have his own report to the president for his personal vision of where we need to go. But the fact of the matter is, my, my uh, good friend, Lou De Janeiro, is a doctor and he's the head of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. When I was at Faster Cures, I used to tell people, you were all patients, you just don't know yet what kind of patient you are. And as a man, I expected to be a prostate cancer patient, maybe a colon cancer patient. Never occurred to me I'd be a leukemia patient. Because we don't know why you get leukemia, it's not family history. It's not necessarily genetic that they've figured out yet. It just happens. So all of a sudden, I found myself a member of the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Well, Lou De Janeiro said something at our summit that really stuck with me. It is never a good time to get cancer. But this is an incredibly exciting time to be fighting cancer. We have the people, the tools, the knowledge, the communications ability to do so much more. You know, I was talking to a reporter yesterday trying to explain to them why data sharing, which the Vice President is obsessed with and passionate about, is so important. And I gave him two examples, because with the press you always need a metaphor or an analogy that usually baseball helps. I said, you know, when I was growing up and there weren't so many teams and they were mainly all on the East Coast, 
maybe I'll over to the river, Mississippi River. <clears throat> you didn't have to have these statisticians for a pitcher to know how to throw a ball to Ted Williams or Mickey Mantle. They knew them. They saw them all the time. They knew what not to do. Nobody had to tell them because they were familiar and it was a small community. Now, with teams all over the country in Canada, and you have thousands of players, hundreds you've never heard of or seen before, we've got these massive statistics that say, throw this guy a curveball that breaks down and to the right, and he'll swing at it and miss every time. That's all because of data sharing. That's all because of big data. If a pitcher goes out and guesses where to throw to a rookie, odds are he'll throw a pitch that that rookie's been looking for his whole life. But you'll notice when a rookie comes into the major leagues and they have a great week, it's usually their last great week because all of a sudden they get more data and people figure them out. That happened to Bryce Harper. He was really hot until he went up against Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit struck him out on three pitches this far away from the home plate because Andy Pettit had seen Bryce Harper's his whole life, and Bryce Harper had never seen Andy Pettit. Well, the same thing with election data. If you only could use polling data from a given area, like, say, Washington, D.C., or a precinct in Maryland, and you couldn't share it outside of that precinct, or you wouldn't share it outside of that precinct, and everybody did the same thing, we would have no clue of who was ahead, of how people vote, of which ethnic groups and demographic groups are doing what. We would have no clue if your bank only paid bills in your zip code. Would you keep that bank? And yet we know that medical data hardly ever leaves the hospital where it's generated. That data in cancer centers hardly ever leaves the cancer center where it's generated. That your personal doctor's data hardly ever leaves his office. My records at Sloan Kettering were online. My records at GW are online. When Sloan Kettering wanted to send all my records to George Washington, they had to fax it. Well, I don't even have a fax machine, so it didn't do, <laughs> didn't do me any good. I just now have to still go to both places to see what my history is. That's just unacceptable. We have to learn from each other. We have to learn, especially in your field, when a new technology shows up, and there are new outcomes, and there are new treatment paths, and new regimens of how to coordinate chemo and traditional radiation and things like focused ultrasound treatments. Without sharing of data, it will delay you by years, absolute years. The first patient to demand that the doctor use a Vastin on his brain cancer was in Galveston, Texas, and the doctor said, it's not approved for that, and the guy said, I don't care. It's my last shot. So she gave it to him, and he had a good outcome. But she gave it to him in an anecdotal way. There was no structured way about it. So months, months, months later, they started a clinical trial, as you're very aware of, with Avastin in brain cancer. We lost a year just because the data from the Galveston thing wasn't shared early on and wasn't replicable because it was just an N of one and had to be studied. We can't afford to lose that time. <clears throat> we can't afford to keep doing trials in one place that have already failed in another place because nobody knows. We can't afford to have publications lock up the raw data behind the article for a year, especially when the government paid for it to begin with. All of these things are things the vice president wants to change. So <clears throat> what is the cancer moonshot? It is your chance to be part of an army that's actually going to take cancer on. The original moonshot was a spectator sport. There really wasn't much you could do to help people get to the moon if you weren't part of the program. In this moonshot, you're already part of the program. You are the program. Everybody we talk to has a role to play, whether it's an individual taking care of a cancer patient, whether it's an Uber driver giving somebody free rides to their chemo, whether it's people taking care of your kids while you're in a trial, or whether it's people just going with you to the doctor. One of the people I hired is a nurse who's volunteered in Haiti after the earthquake, Ebola in Sierra Leone, and her last job was an oncology care coordinator in New York Presbyterian. And she said that was one of the hardest jobs because 
she had to sit with patients who'd just been given a terminal diagnosis. And the doctor leaves the room, and she realizes they, they didn't hear it. And she had to tell them again and sit there with them until they really understood what it was all about. I wanted someone like that on our team so we could deal with the patient's concerns, the patient's journey, in a way that gives us some hope that we can understand it in order to help it. There are many, many different things that will make the Moonshot successful. New technologies, new ways of reviewing and funding new technologies, but the most critical aspect of what will make the Cancer Moonshot successful is your belief that it can be done. Nothing has ever been achieved by people who didn't believe in it. If we believe, and I know that you do, that we can make a difference in cancer's impact on our lives, then we will. And so many people have become cynical over the years because there have been a lot of promises and a lot of false starts. But the world has drastically changed. We have computers beyond our comprehension. We have data sets beyond our comprehension. We have the ability for patients to communicate with each other and with you beyond our comprehension. You know, it was 20 years ago the first website came out. <laughs> the first website. Now, can you imagine if you had to draw a map of all the websites? It would be just a big piece of paper that's solid black. The world has changed dramatically. So of all the things about the Cancer Moonshot I came here to tell you, the most important thing is you're part of it, and your belief that it can succeed is the most critical part of it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attendance this morning. I'm, I'm happy to take some questions, if there are any, as long as they're not too scientific. I'm a history major. Anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, there has been since we started. If you go to whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot, you'll find a place for you to put your ideas and send it to us, and we do read them. We've gotten thousands. Um, and um, also, if you go to um, this new social media site called Medium, like medium rare, medium.com slash cancer dash moonshot, You'll find essays written by all the groups that are coordinating with the Moonshot uh, about their programs. Uh, and it's, it's actually fascinating reading all the different things people are doing. Yes, back there. Or here, sorry. Well, they're going to think I planted you because uh, that's something I forgot to mention. A vice president speaking at the UN Foundation in New York uh, during the General Assembly week in a few weeks. He spoke at the Vatican earlier this year and laid out four or five principles of what should govern the international cooperation in cancer. And um, uh, things like open data sharing across borders, not just institutions, and a focus on the patient accessibility and affordability of, of uh, therapies. Um, we have been actively engaging in developing memoranda of understanding with other countries, especially in the area of proteogenomics. So Vice President announced an, a memorandum of understanding on his trip to Australia a month ago that will be a sharing of 60,000 patients' proteogenomic data with our NCI from Australia and vice versa. We have uh, agreements that we'll be undertaking with Japan, South Korea, that will be announced at the UN Foundation, which the President foreshadowed in May at the White House Nuclear Summit. Um, and the reason you might find that odd that they talked about cancer at a nuclear summit, every meeting the Vice President has with the international community, and he has a lot, they always ask about the cancer moonshot. They all want to be part of it. Israel, United Arab Emirates, Oman, um, uh, all the European countries, South America, they all want to be part of it. 
So he'll be announcing it at the, uh, and the number's not finalized yet, but it'll be over a dozen uh, agreements with countries around data sharing in the proteomic and genomic space uh, so that we can build better databases. And as you can imagine, uh, there, are, there are proteomic genomic differences among different races. So if you have all Asians in your study versus Africans Americans, you find different markers. You find different historical anomalies from the evolution of the genomes of different peoples. Um, so it's really important for us to take the bigger picture. Uh, but it is definitely an international effort. Yes? You're in a room full of investigators looking at thermal medicine, uh, particularly uh, focused ultrasound, ablation, but across the whole temperature range, including hyperthermia. Uh, this is not a broad field in the larger realm of medicine. So the question is, you know, with novel uh, modalities, emerging modalities, how do we get a voice at the table in terms of bringing potentially very promising technologies, therapies uh, to our patients beyond, you know, the usual radiation, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, surgery? What uh, is the pathway for us uh, to bring this promising treatment to patients? Did, did everybody hear that? But how, how do you in particular, given the novelty of the recent or the recency of your technology, get a voice at the table? Well, first, you got a pretty good voice with Neil. He's at every table I've been at. Um, <clears throat> and out of 28 people in the whole country to be on the Blue Ribbon panel, there was Neil. So uh, no small feat. And, uh, and the vice president certainly believes in elevating this industry. Um, that doesn't mean that you get any freer ride than any other technology. It just means people need to know. As you all probably know, but, you know, don't dwell on, in, in medicine in general, there is a huge lag time between new therapies being approved and doctors using them. Either they don't trust it, if it's a new surgical technique, or they dislike what they've been using since med school. Some studies show that doctors prescribe the same drugs their entire career that they prescribe when they get out of med school. Uh, they don't necessarily take the new big thing. Some people don't want to be the first. You know, my, my sister has just, just developed a macular hole. And the surgery for that requires you to lie face down for two days to two weeks, depending. So a company developed an injection to avoid that. And a friend of mine's wife was one of the first people to get it. Worked like a charm for her. Unfortunately, it only worked like a charm 20% of the time. The rest of the time, there are a lot of complications. So when my sister was diagnosed, they didn't even bring it up. She was going to get surgery and lie face down. I brought it up, and then I did a little research, and I said, well, very few doctors want to be experimenters, and for good reason, especially when you're dealing with cancer or your eyes. So the other thing is the, uh, the education of doctors often can come from patients because patients have more time than doctors do. The patients want to have a whole lot more time with their doctors than vice versa. Doctors just don't have the time. So often doctors will say, please don't go on the internet. Please don't look at anything. And that's generally true. But now, with a lot more curated sites, you can find really good information. As I did for my sister, I found a paper that happened to be written by a guy her doctor had trained. And it said, you no longer have to lie face down. And he said, well, we're still going to lie face down, but I appreciate the fact that a lot of people don't do that. I'm going to still do it because that's the way I was trained. But when the new technology comes out there, the learning curve, the adoption curve, is always a huge, huge challenge. One historical analogy, since I'm a history major, when William Coley started using Coley's toxins, in the late 1800s in New York, he was giving his patients bacterial infections because he noticed that the patients who came in with skin infections who had cancer lived longer than people who didn't have infections. So he basically started immunology. And people made fun of him because he was giving his patients infections. But it was working, and we all know now why it was working. 
Unfortunately, he ran up against the military industrial complex that ended up having a whole lot of mustard gas it needed to do something with. And so chemotherapy was born. And immunotherapy was shunted off into the corner for a century, more than a century. Now it's back. And so many of the treatments do exactly what Coley's toxins do. Stimulate your immune system. Let your body fight the cancer rather than poisoning you to death. So there will be a lot of ups and downs in the adoption of a new technology, but William Coley didn't have the benefit of any communication technologies. Nobody else outside New York even knew what he was doing. You have, much, you have a much better shot. And with friends like John Grisham, I think people will hear about it. So, you know, that's, that's good. I would just follow up beyond one technology, and you know, certainly MR guide focused ultrasound or focused ultrasound general has tremendous uh, potential. Uh, but thinking in uh, broader terms, in terms of thermal medicine, you know, what modulation of heat uh, temperature can offer cancer patients? So a much broader scope than just one single technology. Right. No, I, I, I get your point. And, you know, there are so many things we're learning that we, you know, the old thing about when you hear hoof, uh, hoof sounds, think horse, not zebra. Well, for a long time, we've only talked about zebras in cancer. Everything had to be pretty esoteric, had to be, you know, really difficult. There are a whole lot of things that we need to rethink that uh, just, you know, just using a more generalized low form of radiation that stimulates the immune system instead of destroys things is something that, you know, we're starting to learn now, decades after we started using radiation. One last question. Yeah, I, I just had a really quick practical question that I think a lot of people in this room are wondering in terms of this cancer moonshot. I think that a lot of us are doing the science and we have dis a lot of these discoveries that we want to translate, but one of the largest barriers is the regulatory barrier, getting something approved so we can actually get it to the patient. Is there something discussed within the Moonshot Initiative to uh, simplify the pathway to regulatory approval so that we can actually translate these discoveries to actual patient care? Yes, so a couple of things. As I mentioned, just getting the FDA to coordinate cancer reviews in general uh, statistically, this FDA has been much more efficient than previous FDAs in approving all kinds of drugs, but especially cancer drugs. They approve cancer drugs faster than any country in the world, and we've approved a record number of new therapeutics over the last several years. We still have a lot, long way to go with devices. Every time that there's a, no matter what the field, um, uh, you know, good things that you do only affect you. Bad things other people do affect you too. Um, so when, the, some, when there's a device like a hip implant that f starts failing, everybody pulls back on device approvals and they get, a lot of they get a lot of criticism. One of the other things we're doing is making it easier for people to find clinical trials so we don't waste so much time recruiting patients for trials so people can get to the FDA faster. So much of the delay in getting new products to market is getting to the FDA. And on average, clinical trials are delayed six months to a year because everything's ready to go but the patients. We're also making it easier for extraordinary cases to get access to drugs for compassionate purposes. So right now, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, someone has a last hope to get an experimental drug where do you go? Do you go straight to the company? Do you even know the company that may be making a drug? Do you call the FDA? Do you ask your doctor to figure it out? So there are many, many different ways to get there. Very few of them succeed. For every one person who gets a compassionate use, extraordinary use drug that's not approved, a hundred tried. So we're creating a one-stop shop that any doctor, any patient can call that number and find out if there's a drug that's available for extraordinary approval, extraordinary use that's not yet approved for a terminally ill patient. So that those hundred people who needed that drug, not just the one, can get access to it. Simple thing, simple thing that every company has learned to do, give people one place to go when they need help. We haven't learned that in the government, but we're getting there. We're getting there. 
I have to stop. I really appreciate the invitation, and I more than that appreciate the work you all do, and I wish you every success because we need you. Thank you all very much.